everybody and welcome to this video where today we are going to do what we should have done a while ago but you get so alone at times that it just makes sense. Bukowski Book Club, we're gonna start going through it. I have a feeling I already did this on a live stream for members at the beginning of the summer, but we're gonna pretend I didn't because I think I'm gonna start putting all of these things out for everybody to watch and see and do the whole thing, okay? So basically what we do here is the first video, which again was up like six months ago or seven months ago, is me telling you a little bit about the book. One of the reasons why this whole thing kind of derailed was that the Bukowski.net forum and timeline and all that shit kind of went offline for a little bit. And I didn't know what to do because that was like the best resource on the goddamn planet when it comes to Bukowski. I lost a lot of my not my mojo, but like a lot of the stuff where I got my information and shit, right? So that's what the first video in these series usually are. So all the books before this, we did that with. And then the subsequent videos for each book are me reading like my favorite poems out of it. And then what you guys are supposed to do is leave down below what your favorite poems in each section are. So this first section we're doing is basically, and this is kind of how we've been breaking it down. It's like the contents page sections. So this one is going to be this first poem, 1813 to 1883, to the player on page 83. That's how we're going to do this first section. Now, another thing, yesterday I did a video called like Try This Poetry Exercise or whatever, where I took the poem 1883 or 1813 to 1883 and did this like poetry exercise with it that I thought was really, really fun. I will link it. Oh, I did it with the right hand this time. Look at me, I'm learning YouTube after like 20 million years. Okay, I got it. I don't know if I'm gonna read all the poems that I have favorite lines in, but I'm definitely gonna read all the poems that are my favorite poems because for the most part, if you, and I said this in the other video, if you ever want to pick up, how did I get a bunch of sand? And, oh, it came from the book because I had this at the beach. Dumb. If you ever want to read a book of Bukowski's poetry and you don't know which book to read, there are definitely a few books I would recommend, okay? Um, definitely, like, you can't go wrong with um, Burning in Water, Drowning in a Flame just because... The first three sections of that book are collections, like snip, like the best of, of his early works. Okay. So that's great. Um, then you have like the rooming house magicals, which I think we're going to do after this one, um, which is all his early shit. Not all of it, obviously, but like a good chunk of his early shit. So a lot of stuff from burning and water is in that one too. Then you have um, like Days Run Away and Mockingbird Wish Me Luck. Like those are really solid books, okay? War All the Time is a very solid book of the 80s, okay? Like that's the one before this one. So maybe I'll take all those videos and unprivate them and just put those out so everyone could watch them. Maybe I'll do that. I think I'm gonna do that. Anyway, if you were to ask me like what poetry books of Bukowski's like are must reads. There is probably four other than the ones I've just said. And here's what I'll say. This one is definitely one of them, but you have to understand something. The Bukowski that most people love is the early Bukowski, the whoring, the drunkard, the gambler, living on luck, the like barely enough to get by walking around in shit stained pants and shit like that. By the time he wrote, you get so alone at times, it just makes sense. He was living in San Pedro in a house that he owned. He was driving a badass fucking car, like a fucking BMW. I think he was married to Linda Lee and he had made it like, um, Barfly was already being made. I think at that point, might have already come out by the time this book came out because I think this is 86. So a lot of how he's writing these poems is looking from 
the the idea of I've made it and looking back at who he used to be. And for a lot of people, when you pick this book up thinking you're going to get the badass beating motherfuckers up, yeah, right, Bukowski, you don't get that from this. So this book ends up, I think, at first, if you haven't read a lot of his shit and you don't know a lot about his timeline, I think this book kind of puts people off a little bit because it's not what they want. So you have to want to take the whole journey. The problem that a lot of people have with Bukowski, the problem a lot of women have with Bukowski. And when I here, I'm gonna fucking get some real shit. We're we're getting re- we're gonna get real here, guys. You gotta fucking like be okay with this because this is about to get nasty. It pisses me off how many like women don't like Bukowski because they have heard that he's a womanizer. They have heard that he's a piece of shit. They have read on fucking Instagram reels and fucking TikTok and whatever the fuck else they might consume words on a flashing screen that if you are dating a man that reads Bukowski, you better run. You better run, girl. That's a bad man. That's a bad man, okay? The problem is most women who actually read Bukowski end up fucking loving Bukowski. The women who don't read Bukowski, who've never read Bukowski, are the ones that call him names and he's a piece of shit and all this other stuff. Now, I'm not saying that if you are a woman, you will read Bukowski and you will love Bukowski. But what I'm saying is more people hate him who've never even opened a book of his because they were told that he's bad. And when narratives get spun, you have to go along with the narrative. Okay? There's a lot of narratives out there right now that have no basis in truth, but that tons of people just follow blindly because they're fucking idiots. Now, am I saying women are idiots for thinking Bukowski's a piece of shit? No, because I'm going to let you in on a little something. Bukowski's a piece of shit, but it's okay. Like, we're not reading his poetry because he was... A man of high ideals. We're reading his poetry because he's flawed and he wears his heart on his sleeve. That's why you fucking read poetry. A poet who writes everything perfect and who had never done a wrong thing in his whole fucking life. Who the fuck wants to read that motherfucker? That's like the, like even the Bible. The Bible is full of people who were tragic pieces of shit. And this is the Bible that all these good motherfuckers are supposed to be reading and like living their life to. Like, go through it. Find me one fucking good person in the Bible. And if you say Jesus, I'm going to smack you on the mouth. Okay? Do it. Seriously. But all of you women out there, hearts, okay? Me and you. But when you just say somebody's bad because you have heard that or read that, and then some of you go, I read, I read stuff, I read, okay, cool, you read stuff, okay? He's written so much more shit than anyone you've ever read. Fine, you read a poem where he said something that hurt your fucking feelings. He's a flawed piece of shit. Nobody likes him, okay? This is the kind of person whose poetry you read. This is not the kind of person you vote for for president. Okay? There's a huge fucking difference. Okay? He's not trying to indoctrinate us with his bullshit. He's opening his fucking chest enough for you to see the pus and the mud and the shit and the blood and the crap. Because he knows he's a horrible piece of shit. And that is the art Showing your flaws, your bullshit to everyone and being okay with what happens off after the, off, with what happens after a diet. Jesus. Okay, now that I just blew your mind, um, go back and watch the Bukowski Book Club videos and notice that he's fucking brilliant. There's a lot of brilliant people out there who are pieces of shit. Now, there's other writers who are pieces of shit who I don't appreciate because they try to hide 
their hate and their disgusting bullshit. There are writers like H.P. Lovecraft. I love H.P. Lovecraft. I grew up reading H.P. Lovecraft. But if you want to talk about a horrible piece of human fucking garbage, that's who that is. But there's a lot of people who want to say that he was only a horrible piece of garbage because of his time. But there were also people during that time who weren't horrible pieces of shit. So that one's a hard one too. Blowing me up. That's some exciting stuff, guys. Okay, so anyway, let's move on. Let's let's get so alone. Let's get so alone. It just makes sense, okay? Oh, I thought I didn't even tell you. So the books I would say to read are You Get So Alone at Times, it just makes sense. Because um, I think, honestly, this is probably his best book of poetry. Just across the board, all right? Um, then... I would say if you could somehow take Love is a Dog from Hell and play the piano drunk like a percussion instrument until your fingers begin to bleed a bit, if you could like merge those into one book, I think that book would be like almost the like most solid book of poetry ever because like Bukowski's poetry books are big as fuck except for Play the Piano Drunk. But Play the Piano Drunk I think is like seriously one of the most solid books he ever put out. But it is tiny. So we don't need tiny. We're fucking reading Bukowski. We need fucking 300 pages to sink our dick into. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't read little fucking slim volumes of poetry. What the fuck is that? We ain't reading Berryman. Am I right, guys? And then um, the last night on Earth poems. And I say that because even though that wasn't written that long after this... And this actually wasn't written that long after Love is a Dog from Hell. But the last night of the Earth poems are like a man who did everything he did, did everything he said he was going to do, and then realizes that he's dying and coming to terms with that, being okay with that, and finally walking off into the sunset even though like he wrote a couple other books after and but like the po the posthumous shit was just like seeping out of john martin's fucking drippy fucking cock for the next fucking 20 fucking years but those books you have to have those books on your shelf and i strongly recommend the other ones i've said basically everything we've talked about in bukowski book club so far I think you should have. And um, once we get past uh, the last night of the earth poems, like up until that, because I think rooming house and then last night, because I think sepagerian, sepagerian stew, sepagerian. I don't know why that word's so fucking hard for me. Let's just say octogerian, but that's not right. Sepagerian stew. Um, I think that came out after last night it might not have that might be in between this and what the oh i can just tell you right now look at me look at me being a smart little bunny you get so alone then barfly came out then rooming house then hollywood then sepatagerian and then the last night of earth pumps uh you get so alone came out in 86 and sepatagerian came out in 90 and then last night came out in 92 and then again, Betting on the Muse came out in 96 and Bone Palace Ballet came out in 97. After Bone Palace Ballet, that's when John Martin's editing went haywire and he just started like rewriting Bukowski shit. I think Linda Lee was paying closer attention maybe during Betting on the Muse and Bone Palace. But now that uh, Abel DeBrito is overseeing the work that echo puts out all that shit's way better so like the essential the one with the cover and he's there and the lines like that one's okay too and all the on on drinking on cats on dicks on tits and hey, so anyway, let's get through this okay let's let's read some of this up so i'm going to read some lines that i like and um some poems that i like so in 1813-1883 I like the, some men never die, some men never live. Some men drop books on the floor. <sighs> That's a good one. Okay, Red Mercedes. Here we go. 
Naturally, we are all caught in down moods. It's a matter of chemical imbalance and an existence which at times seems to forbid any real chance at happiness. I was in a down mood when this rich pig, along with his blank enamorata in this red Mercedes, cut in front of me at the racetrack parking. It clicked inside of me in a flash. I'm gonna pull that fucker out of his car and kick his ass. I followed him into valet parking, parked behind him, and jumped from my car, ran up to his door, and yanked at it. It was locked. The windows were up. I rapped on the window on his side. Open that up. Open up. I'm gonna bust your ass. He just sat there looking straight ahead. His woman did likewise. They wouldn't look at me. He was 30 years younger, but I knew I could take him. He was soft and pampered. I beat on the window with my fist. Come on out, shithead. I'm gonna start breaking glass. He gave a small nod to his woman. I saw her reach into the glove compartment, open it up, and slip him the 32. I saw him hold it down low and snap off the safety. I walked off toward the clubhouse. It looked to be a damn good card that day. All I had to do was be there. Hysterical. Good shit. Then on 19, the poem, Working It Out, I have a little part. Uh, Everything is so sweetly awful, so continuously and sweetly awful. The art of consummation. Life eating life. Once in a dream, I saw a snake swallowing its own tail. It swallowed and swallowed until it got halfway around. And there it stopped. And there it stayed. It was stuffed with its own self. Some fix that. We only have ourselves to go on. And it's enough. I really love that. Because every time someone talks about a snake eating itself they're usually talking about it in a bad sense and here i think is the only time i've ever heard that analogy be used as a good thing and it totally makes sense i get it i get it and a lot of people like this motherfucker who like left a comment on one of my videos today he thinks people who are like me and maybe you who were like I don't need someone to fucking tell me how to do what I do. I just fucking do the thing. I am an artist. I create art. I do the fucking thing. They think that someone who speaks like that is just full ego. You have to believe in yourself in order to do the things that make you an artist, that make you fucking great. Whether people believe in you or not. Art is subjective, you stupid fucks. Okay? You need to believe in you. You need to be your biggest fan. If that to you is just all ego and there's no substance there, then I don't know. Keep going to your little fucking workshops and having people tell you that you write poorly and you need to revise. But for everyone else, be the fucking best you you could be and you will either be remembered for your art or you will be forgotten about. But at the end of the day, you did your art so everyone else could suck it. You know what I'm saying? All right, moving right along. Let's go. Oh, here's one in Trash Can Lives. What does this say? This is on page 23. It's when you're on the row that you notice that everything is owned and that there are locks on everything. Fucking true as shit, dog. Look, my non-ambitious ambition on page 27. I have a little note I wrote in here. Let me see what Bukowski says first, and then I'll say what I said. It seemed to me that I had never met another person on earth as discouraging to my happiness as my father. And it appeared that I had the same effect upon him. It says, my dad with me never wanting to share my happiness. That, that, That checks out. So downtown L.A., since I've been going there a lot, let's read this one. 
throwing your shoe at 3 a.m. and smashing the window, then sticking your head through the shards of glass and laughing as the phone rings, with authoritative threats as you curse back through the receiver, slam it down as the woman screeches, What the fuck you doing, you asshole? You smirk, look at her, what's this? You're cut somewhere, love it. The dripping of red onto your dirty, torn undershirt. The whiskey roaring through your invincibility. You're young, you're big, and the world stinks from centuries of humanity while you're on course. And there's something left to drink. It's good, it's a dramatic farce, and you can handle it with verve, style, grace, and elite mysticism. Another hotel drunk. Thank God for hotels and whiskey and ladies of the street. You turn to her. You chippy hunk of shit. Don't wait. You chippy hunk of shit. Don't badmouth me. I'm the toughest guy in town. You don't know who the hell you're in this room with. She just looks half believing, a cigarette dangling. She's half insane, looking for an out. She's hard, she's scared. She's been fooled, taken, abused, used, overused. But under all that, to me, she's the flower. I see her as she was before she was ruined by the lies, theirs and hers. To me, she's new again, and I'm new. We have a chance together. I walk over and fill her drink. You got class, doll. You're not like the others. She likes that, and I like it too, because to make a thing true, all you got to do is believe. There you go. There's a fucking line for you. To make a thing true, all you've got to do is believe. I sit across from her and she tells me about her life. I give her refills, lighter cigarettes. I listen and the city of angels listens and she's had a hard row. I get sentimental and decide not to fuck her. One more man for her won't help and one more woman for me won't matter. Besides, she doesn't look that good. Actually, her life is boring and rather common, but most are. Mine is too except when lifted by whiskey. She gets into a crying jag. She's cute, really, and pitiful. All she wants is what she always wanted, only it's getting further and further away. And then she stops crying. We just drink and smoke, it's peaceful. I won't bother her that night. I have trouble trying to yank the pillow down or the pull down bed from the wall. She comes up to help. We pull together. Suddenly it releases, flings itself upon us. A hard, death like, mindless object. It knocks us upon our asses beneath it as first in fear we scream, then begin laughing, laughing like crazy. She gets the bathroom first, then I use it. Then we stretch out and sleep. I am awakened in the early morning. She is down at my center. She has me in her mouth and is working ferociously. It's all right, I say. You don't have to do that. She continues, finishes. In the morning, we pass the desk clerk he has on thick rim dark glasses. Seems to sit in the shade of some tarantula dream. He was there when we entered. He is there now, some eternal darkness. We are almost to the door when he says, Don't come back. We walk two blocks up, turn left, one block, then one block south, enter. Willie's at the middle of the block, place ourselves at the bar center. We order beer for starters. We sit there. She searches her purse for cigarettes. Then I get up, move towards the jukebox, put a coin within, come back, sit down. She lifts her glass. The first one's best. I lift my drink. And the last, 
Outside, the traffic runs up and down, down and up, going nowhere. Whew! Goddamn. Lot of wisdom in that shit right there. Lot of wisdom. <sighs> the poem driving test. There's a little bit I highlighted. Highlighted? Where? How come I can't see it? It says, I was a member of the club and I felt like a fucking fool. Yep. Um... And then on, that's why funerals are so sad, I have another part highlighted. It says, you have no idea, cousin, how many men can do it but won't. And then for some reason next to it, I put most poets, almost all writers. I think I'm going to have to read that poem to figure out what the fuck I meant by that. When I wrote a lot of the notes in here, I was living in my property in the desert, in the trailer, drunk on giant bottles of red in the middle of the night dancing to like ska music and blues and shit and reading this chain smoking under the extractor fan and um i remember just like the whole like i read a poem and then i pontificate i read a poem and then i pontificate it was like that was what i did for weeks it, it was a very fun time i highly recommend everybody do this just put on your favorite music that you can move to read some poetry read it out loud while you're drinking and smoking and using whatever vice you're using i really don't do much of either anymore but okay let's read this fucking thing why the funerals are so sad He's got all the tools, but he's lazy, has no fire. The ladies drain his senses, his emotion. He wants to drive his flashy car. He gets a wax job once a month, throws away his shoes when they get scuffed. But he's got the best right hand in the business, and his left hook can cave in a man's ribs, if I can get him to do it. But he has no goddamn imagination. He's in the top 10, but the music is missing. He makes the money, but it's all going to get away from him. Someday he's not going to be able to do even the little he's doing now. His idea of victory is to pull down as many women's panties as he can. He's champ at that. And when you see me screaming at him in the corner between rounds... I'm trying to awaken him to the fact that the time is now. He just grins at me. Hell, you fight him. He's a bitch. You have no idea, cousin, how many men can do it but won't. And I wrote, most poets, almost all writers. <laughs> oh, man. But, but I, I, I feel for the champ. I feel for the champ. Um, that is definitely a ring that I have won belts in as well. Um, okay, I'm going to read this one too because I have this squared. Um, this is called cornered. Well, they said it would come to this. Well, they said it would come to this. Old. Talent gone, fumbling for the word, hearing the dark footsteps I turn, look behind me. Not yet, old dog, soon enough. Now they sit talking about me. Yes, it's happened. He's finished. It's sad. He never had a great deal, did he? Well, no, but now. Now they are celebrating my demise in taverns I no longer frequent. Now I drink alone at this malfunctioning machine as the shadows assume shapes i fight the slow retreat now my once promise dwindling dwindling now lighting new cigarettes pouring more drinks it has been a beautiful fight still is but i mean with jane and I have a little thing here. I have a little thing somewhere else, too. People keep making fun of it. Until they... No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so bumming with Jane. 
There wasn't a stove, and we put cans of beans and hot water in the sink to heat them up. And we read the Sunday papers on Monday after digging them out of trash cans. But somehow we managed money for wine and the rent, and the money came off the streets, out of hawk shops, out of nowhere. And all that mattered was the next bottle. And we drank and sang and fought. We're in and out of drunk takes, car crashes, hospitals. We barricaded ourselves against the police and other rumors hated us and the desk clerk of the hotel feared us and it went on and on and it was one of the most wonderful times of my life now here's another thing about Bukowski during this period of his life he's married to Linda Lee in his big ass house in San Pedro okay everything is what he'd always wanted, okay? But what's he writing about? He's writing about, this is the thing about Bukowski. He, he, was a, he was a scared little boy, a scared coward, but that's okay. That's who he was. That's who all of us are. Hard on the sleeve. What's he writing about now that he's made it? He's writing about people thinking that he's finished. And he's writing about one of the most wonderful times of his life when he was with Jane, drunk and fucking in hotels, living at the bottom. That's where he was comfortable. Now that he's at this place where he's made it, he is so fucking uncomfortable. Fish out of water, even in a happy marriage with a young, beautiful woman, it's too much. He misses the, the warm hug of living that fucked life and being the fucking poet, the writer who everyone was at odds with. And now everyone's just like, he doesn't got it anymore. He doesn't got it anymore because a lot of his poems now are about him making it. And nobody wants to see a fucking guy who everyone thought was a piece of shit, who was going to never make it, fucking make it. Now he's just gloating. Nobody wants to fucking read that shit. Especially the people who never thought he had it in the first place. You know, like they don't want to be fucking proved wrong all the time. They would rather see you be a piece of shit and then hate you from afar. You know what I'm saying? Hello, darkness, my old friend. That's the poem that we're on now. And it starts like this right here. Darkness falls upon humanity and faces become terrible things that wanted more than there was. All our days mar are marked with unexpected affronts, some disastrous, others less so. But the process is wearing and continuous attrition rules. Most give way, leaving empty spaces where people should be. Our progenerators, our educational systems, the land, the media, the way have deluded and misled the masses. They have been defeated by the by the aridity of the actual dream. They were, uh, they were unaware that achievement or victory or luck or whatever the hell you want to call it must have its defeats. It's only the regathering and going on which lends substance to whatever magic might possibly evolve. And now, as we're ready to self-destruct, there is very little left to kill, which makes the tragedy... Less and more, much, much more. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so January, here on page 55... We're going to go over this one real quick. 
This one I have some funny notes in. Not funny notes, but just, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, so this is called January. Here, you see this hand. Here, you see this sky, this bridge. Hear this sound, the agony of the elephant, the nightmare of the midget, while caged parrots sit in a flourish of color, while pieces of people fall over the edge like pebbles, like rocks, madhouses screaming in pain as the royalty of the world is photographed, say on horseback, or say watching a procession in their honor. As the junkies drunk, as the alkies drink, as the whores whore, as the killers kill, the albatross blinks its eye, the weather stays mostly the same. This poem is very strange. Not strange because it's weird, but strange because we're back to... Not where I think he is trying, but he, he I feel like he's trying here. Whenever Bukowski writes about the albatross, I think the albatross is actually him trying to gain acceptance. Because whenever he writes poems like this, to me, it just screams a guy who people don't think is academic enough or worth a damn enough this is him going look at me i'm like you like me and i know that might be fucked up to say it but like he's such a fucking heart on the sleeve motherfucker you know and so for him to get all like the agony of the elephant the nightmare of the midget the caged parrots sit in a flourish of color like as the royalty of the world is photographed, say on horseback or say watching a procession in their honor, you know, um, like the albatross blinks its eyes. But like if the poem, like what I have written here, a better poem is as the junkies drunk, as the alkies drink, as the whores whore, as the killers kill. The weather stays mostly the same in January. I think that's a better poem than all that other stuff. And it would be more memorable than him just as Dick's spit juice. Like, okay, as grass grows green and trees tremble, it's like, cool, dude, you, you know how to... You know how to do the thing. And a lot of you are going to get mad that I'm saying all this shit. Um, okay, so we do have quite a few. Wait, what page did I say we were going to? 80 something? Oh, man, we got some fucking bangers in here, dude. Oh, banger after banger. Okay, so the man in the brown suit. On page 59. Okay. Fuck, he was small, maybe 5'3", 135 pounds. I didn't like him. He sat there at his desk at the bank, and as I waited in line, he seemed to have a way of glancing at me, and I stared back. I don't know what it was that caused the animosity. He had this little mustache that drooped at the ends. He was in his mid-40s, uh, and most people, and like most people who worked in banks, he had a non-committal yet self-important personality. One day, I almost went over the railing to ask him, what the hell was he looking at? Today, I went and stood in line and saw him leave his desk. One of the lady tellers was having a problem with a man at her window, and the man in the brown suit began to hold counsel with both of them. Suddenly, the man in the brown suit vaulted the railing, got behind the other man, wrapped his arms about him, then dragged him along to a latch entrance along the railing, reached over, unhooked the latch while still managing to hold the man. Then he dragged him in there, latched the gate, and while holding the man, he told one of the girls, Phone the police! The man he was holding was about 20, 
black, a good 6'2", maybe 190 pounds. And I thought, hey, break loose, man. Jail is a long time. But he just stood there being held. I left before the police arrived. The next time I went to the bank, the man in the brown suit was behind his desk. And when he glanced at me, I just smiled a little. But I love that line, man. I thought, hey, break loose, man. Jail is a long time. Fuck, dude. That's such a good line. Oh, my God. Oh, okay, what's this line I have underlined here on page 64 of A Magician Gone? I turn my back to the crowd and climb the upper grandstand steps to the wall so people wouldn't see me cry. That's about the jock that died, I believe. Um, well, that's just the way it is on page 65. Sometimes when everything seems at its worst, when all conspires and gnaws and the hours, days, weeks, years seem wasted, stretched there upon my bed in the dark, looking upward at the ceiling, I get what many will consider an obnoxious thought. It's still nice to be Bukowski. Or Matt Wall. I get you. I get you. I get you, motherfucker. I get you. Okay, Rift. If I recall, this is like probably one of my favorite poems in the whole book. I think. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is good. Okay, so this is called Rift. I can't live with you anymore, she said. Look at you. Uh, I asked. Look at you sitting in that goddamn chair, your belly sticking out, your underwear, your burnt cigarette holes in your shirts. All you do is suck on that goddamn beer, bottle after bottle. What do you get out of that? The damage has been done, I told her. What are you talking about? Nothing matters, and we know nothing matters, and that matters. You're drunk. Come on, baby, let's get along. It's easy. Oh, man, isn't that the fucking truth? Come on, baby, let's get along. It's easy. Not for me, she screamed. Not for me. She ran into the bathroom to put on her makeup. I got up for another beer. I sat back down. Just had the new bottle to my mouth when she came out of the bathroom. Holy shit, she screamed. You're disgusting. I laughed right into the bottle, gagged, spit a mouthful of beer across my undershirt. My God, she said. She slammed the door and was gone. I looked at the closed door and at the doorknob. And strangely, I didn't feel alone. every fucking day I think that I wrote that on here right after my ex left actually god damn why do people feel the need to talk to you oh I feel that okay so here's a poem called miracle on page 75 I have just listened to the symphony which Mozart dashed off in one day, and it had enough wild and crazy joy to last forever, whatever forever is. Mozart came as close as possible to that. Okay, this poem is called A Non-Urgent Poem on page 76. I had this fellow write me that he felt there wasn't the urgency in my poems of the present compared to the poems of the past, like we were talking about earlier. Now, if this is true, why did he write me about that? That's a fucking good ass question. And this goes for a lot of you who say stupid, ridiculous shit in comments. Why do you comment? Have something to say, have it be worth something, 
Don't just do it because you're bored and you got nothing else to do and you're tired of jerking off. And for some reason, you stopped watching porn trying to edify yourself here with me. Like, say something of value. I'm giving you tons of value. Don't just pop off with some dumbass shit. Like, oh, yeah. Fuck off. Say something that matters. Now, if this is true, why did he write me about it? Have I made his days more incomplete? It's possible. Well, I too have felt let down by writers. I once thought were powerful, or at least very damned good, but I never considered writing them to inform them that I sensed their demise. I found the best thing I can do was to just type away at my own work and let the dying die as they always have. Boom! Fuck, man! God damn! That is so true. Here's the fucking thing. If you think other things are shit, go do something better. That's it. Shut your fucking trap. There is no art in you bitching. Just be better. The only reason why I've done anything I've done is because most stuff is shit and I am better. I have been better. That's it. And again, I don't want to sit here and brag. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to say I do the thing because the thing is easier than fucking bitching. Well, that's not true. Bitching is really fucking easy. And some of you guys are like you excel at it because you don't know how to fucking do anything else. But there's no art in bitching. Create something. Be better than. It's not hard to be better than me, but none of you have the fucking balls to just fucking do it. Even fucking YouTube. Like, there, I, I've been doing this for fucking ever, and I only have like 2,000 subs. Okay? I'm not very likable. It is very easy to be better at this than I am. So, shut your fucking trap and just make a better fucking YouTube channel. It's easy. Oh, my God. <sighs> Got a little bookmark here from a million years ago. My first affair with that older woman. When I look back now at the abuse I took from her, I feel shame that I was so innocent. But I must say, she did match me drink for drink, and I realized that her life, her feelings for things, had been ruined along the way, and that I was no more than a temporary companion. She was ten years older and mortally hurt by the past and the present. She treated me badly, desertion, other men. She brought me immense pain continually. She lied, stole, there was desertion, other men. Yet we had our moments, and our little soap opera ended with her in a coma in the hospital, and I sat at her bed for hours talking to her, and then she opened her eyes and saw me. I knew it would be you, she said, then closed her eyes, and the next day she was dead. I drank alone for two years after that. Heartbreaking. Okay, on page 80, there's a poem called The Freeway Life. I'm not going to read all of it, but there's a couple parts in here I really like. Defeat can strengthen just as victory can weaken. Don't forget that. Victory fucking weakens you. Fucking does. Thinking the courage it took to get out of bed each morning to face the same things over and over was enormous. I hear you. You ought to stay. This is a poem about the racetrack and I just circled, you ought to stay away from this place. <laughs> yeah, I probably should. What was the poem we were going up to? Let me see, because I think we just hit it. The player. Yeah, that was it. Okay, so that was the first section of um, the Bukowski Book Club. For you get so alone at times, it just makes sense. Long ass video. Um, but the next section we're going to do, and we'll come back next week for this, is going to be poems 
Uh, P.O. Box 11946, Fresno, California, 93776, on page 85, all the way down to Glenn Miller on page 152. So basically, the second page of the table of contents is what we're going to be going over next time. So again, what poems are your favorite out of that first section? Which ones did you like? Which ones did you hate? Leave it in the comments down below. And next week, we're going to get crunk on this shit, okay? Sorry, I'm a little hyper. I've had a lot of coffee already. But what are you going to do? All right. Join the crew down below. Anarchy crew members get weekly writing Zooms. Everybody else gets daily um, live streams. If you are chapbook of the month or higher, you get my work when I print it or comes out ebooks or whatever sent to you. And then if you need mentorship or anything like that, whether it's monthly or weekly, there are tiers for that sign up down below. Again, the month of November is almost over. So on the beach poems about the beach. Um, there's only three copies of this left. Um, 50 copies. The first 25 were signed. Um, once these are gone, they're gone. Anxious Anxiety, or uh, Early Short Stories, 2007 to 2013. Uh, I have about eight copies of these left. Um, again, once these are gone, they're gone. If you want them, email me at ihatematwalt at gmail.com, and I will send you an invoice. Also, the end of everything, uh, 125 of these signed and numbered. Um, I have about 10 of these left, and then I have... Um, winner your mom sought me prize for poetry. I have some of those left as well. But again, once November's over, on the beach and anxious anxiety are either going back into the vault or they will be sold out and never to be seen again. And then in December, we will have new books out for you guys to look at. Okay. Click down below, type hard everybody, poetic anarchy. I will talk to you all later.